Good morning. It's uh, Brother Chad Long again, Del High Baptist Church. And uh, hope you're having a good morning so far. And I realized that the themes and the uh, the lessons from Ephesians, it, it seems to be redundant. I mean, uh, this, this letter does have a redundant theme. I mean, between the different doxologies that, that you see that Paul offers about Christ, the, uh, the continuing return to a prayer and then a message on unity and the church and, and how we're supposed to love and, and see each other as equals. I mean, it's a continuous, it, it's a redundant theme. I mean, we're going into chapter 4 now and we've seen this already multiple times. When we finish chapter 3, you'll notice Paul's praying for us again and saying things like, you know, I would that God would uh, re uh, grant you according to the riches of his, his glory to be strengthened by his spirit in the inner man um, that Christ would dwell in your hearts that you'd be able to comprehend with all the saints what is oh and I love this verse uh, chapter 3 verse 18 that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length depth and height and I can't imagine I can't imagine what he had in mind but I've had I've had it explained like this you know if the height is heaven and the depth is is you know all the way down to hell death and hell and the breadth is is Christ's arms around us I mean just the picture of, of how high and low and wide and deep the love of God is toward us and what all he's done for us and I mean just just thinking about all of those things and then understanding his love and and how he wants us to love each other and how abundantly he wants to bless us when we're in his will. I mean, all of these things are redundant Christian themes, things that we know. But isn't it interesting that the Lord has to remind us every day. I was talking to a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine yesterday, and he was telling me how he, he feels like all he, he does is run around putting out little fires. He says, I'm not a pastor, I'm a fireman. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it seems like uh, there's always ladies in our church that are making each other mad. Um, they're, they're, one of them's upset because that one did this or this one said that. And he said, I feel like I spend most of my time trying to get them to, to forgive one another and love one another and unify. Uh, he said, it's, it's, uh, he said, I'm sure the men do it too, but it's, it's real common in our church with women. So I hear that and I think, you know, this may be redundant. This may be something Paul felt like he had to say multiple times throughout the letter. But unity is important. Love is important. And in order for us as a church to be able to be the body that Christ wants us to be under his headship, We've got to daily look at these things that are keeping us from being unified. And it'll differ from church to church. But the devil's busy, okay? And he's working hard. And he's trying to keep us at each other's throats. So as we start chapter 4 of Ephesians, <clears throat> Paul's going to come right back to something he's already said. And, I mean, he's made clear. But sometimes you have to be redundant. Uh, I, I'll say this and I'll get into it. When I was going to Bible college, and, and you don't have to go to Bible college to preach, Dr. Curtis Hudson's one of my heroes. In fact, he's my favorite. And Dr. Curtis Hudson didn't go to Bible college. He was given his doctorate. Uh, it was, it was an, an honorary title that a college gave him because he poured his heart into the Word of God, and he understood it better than people who came out of Bible college. There are several like that, that they got an honorary doctorate. Dr. Curtis Hudson didn't get a doctorate in school. He's a doctor of the Bible because the Holy Spirit taught it to him and he preached it. Uh, so we, we call him Dr. Curtis Hudson and he does have one, but it was given to him. He didn't have to, I, I wouldn't say it was given to him. He worked hard for it, but he didn't go to Bible college. You don't have to go to Bible college to to, to preach. And the best college ever is the one you, you get into with the Holy Spirit. But when I was going to Bible college, one of the things they told us is sometimes repetition is good. You want to continue to repeat the point. If you say your sermon title is on faith or your sermon's about faith, 
you want to keep coming back to the theme, the main theme, what it is you're teaching. And you want to be repetitive because it helps people to remember and retain it. You know, these videos, are even 10, 20 minutes long, they're not long. But we don't retain most of the stuff we hear or read. We really don't. We retain a percentage of it. So I can understand why Paul would be redundant. I can understand why the point would need to be reiterated. Because if it's not, we're going to lose sight of it. We're going to forget it. As we go throughout our day and throughout our week and throughout the months of our lives and the years, we get away from some of the things that God's been trying to teach us because there's, there's several things that we're trying to focus on at once. So there, there is a need for it, and I hope that, I hope that I don't scare anybody away by sounding redundant. But uh, there is some repetition here. So as we get into chapter four, verse one, the Bible says, "I," that's Paul. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. We've mentioned that multiple times. But Paul is a prisoner at Rome. He's having some success with uh, the ministry even there, but he is he is a prisoner. But he says, I beseech you, I beg you, I plead with you, is what that means. That you would walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Now, none of us can ever really walk worthy. All he's saying is that what God has called you to do is important. And you need to try to walk as though it's important. You need to exhibit that, um, that you understand what God's done for you. And that you're willing to exhibit that outwardly. The, the you know work on the inner you and then work it out outwardly uh, and, and the best explanation I can give for that is uh, if my vocation is as a mechanic I need to be the best mechanic I can be if my vocation is a truck driver I need to be the best truck driver I can be if I'm a roofer if I'm a AC specialist or whatever my vocation is I need to try to walk worthy of that vocation I happen to be called to preach. It's not something everybody's called to do specifically, but we are all called to spread the gospel. And what Paul's asking us to do is just to do the best at it with, that we can. Not to just do the minimal amount, but do the best we can and walk worthy of the vocation or with we are called. He says, with all lowliness and meekness. That means don't get high-minded about it. If you're a good mechanic, and I have worked with some good ones. Uh, Mason Hodges, one of the best mechanics I ever met. <coughs> but he also stretched around like a peacock, and that's getting high-minded. When you know you're good at something, we have a tendency to pat ourselves on the back for it and uh, and to brag on it. And, and I've done that. Uh, I've found myself bragging on things I've done. And that's not lowliness. That's not meekness. We're supposed to do the best we can and do it humbly. With long suffering, which is another word for patience, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, well, it's a, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, synonym. It's a synonym for patience. They, they actually are a little different, but it's a synonym. But with patience, he's saying that you know, be humble and have patience, forbearing one another in love. That means putting up with a whole lot of stuff you know you don't have to put up with and putting up with it anyway. It's just like my friend telling me he's trying to help these ladies and trying to keep them from, from being angry at each other all the time. Well, he doesn't have to put up with that, but he does. That's forbearing one another in Christ, in love. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, we keep coming back to unity, and this is that repetition I was talking about. This is that redundancy I was talking about this whole letter is seemed to be aimed at Christian unity and the fact that we are all united in Christ and that one's not above the other and that the Jews not above the Greek and the, the Greeks not above the Jew and that we need to be unified well again I know that's been just continually repeated but it needs to be until we get it through our heads unity is important so I'll read it again he says endeavoring to keep the unity Having it's one thing, keeping it's the other. It's what my pastor friend was talking to me about. You can begin in unity, but you can get away from it. So you have to endeavor to keep it. <clears throat> the unity of the Spirit. The Spirit's what keeps us unified. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't be. You'll, uh, you won't find unity if you don't have the Holy Spirit. Even with these 
protests and riots and things going on now, they're not unified because they don't have the Spirit of God in them. You think they're unified because they're all one group, but the more part doesn't know what they're all gathered together about. So uh, it's, that's not unity, and it's not an example of unity. They have no structure. They have some that are smashing things, some that are walking along not hurting anything. They're not unified in their in their attempts or in their in their goals, and they're not endeavoring to keep unity. They're just... I didn't mean to get on that. But we're supposed to keep the unity in the Spirit and in the bond of peace. And peace is important because true peace comes from God and should be exhibited in us. We hear about peace. People want to talk about peace. But only those who have Christ in their heart can truly exhibit real peace. And Paul wants us to. Verse 4, there is one body. One body, one and one only. One body of Christ. That's not to say there's only one church out there. There's a lot of different churches with a lot of different uh, doctrinal beliefs. and Some of them are way off. Some of them are dead on. But in all truthfulness, there's one body of Christ. When we get raptured up to heaven, he's going to bring up everybody who truly loves him. There's going to be one body. Now, in our local body, we can only focus on our particular uh, body, but... There's really only one body of Christ. It's it's a shame that we can't get all those who truly love God together and just have one big church. But there's a reason on this earth why God gave us the local church where we live. So I'm not going to get into that now. But in, in in spiritual speaking, there is one there is one body, and He tells us that. We'll we'll cover that another time. There's one body. There's one spirit. That's easier to understand. There's one spirit. Everybody who truly has Christ in their heart, has that spirit, and is a part of that body. Even if we're indifferent, you know, if you're, if you're serving God in your church somewhere, on the other side of the world, and I'm serving God in my church, we're still in one body. We still have one spirit that unites us. He says, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. There's only one hope in our calling, and that hope is Christ. That hope has always been Christ. That hope will always be Christ. Um... He gives us the Holy Spirit to indwell us, but our hope is in Christ and what He did in His redemptive work on the cross. It says, uh, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Man, I wish some of these other denominations would read that. There's one baptism, and water baptism ain't it. Let me say that again. There's one baptism, and water baptism is not it. Water baptism is not the one baptism the Lord's referencing here. Water baptism is an ordinance that is important that's given to us to reflect the one baptism. The one baptism, the only baptism, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that's received upon salvation. When you accept Christ as your Savior, He baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's the only true baptism, the only real baptism there is. Water baptism reflects that. Water baptism is something we choose to do, that we need to do, or we're actually commanded to do. Um, some people may choose not to. We're commanded to, and we do it in obedience, and we do it to show on the outside what we've done already on the inside, and we accept Christ as our Savior, and He baptizes us into the Holy Spirit. So when he says one baptism, he's recognizing that there's one true baptism. The other baptism is just a picture of that. It's a symbol, and it's an important one. I'll give you the best example I can here off the fly, off the cuff. But this, this ring represents my marriage. I have one marriage, one wife. I only have one. I do not have multiple. I have one wife. And that one wife is not... You know, that marriage is not, uh, this ring is not the marriage. This ring is just a symbol of the marriage. This ring is just uh, something I wear to remind me of the, 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 the commitment that I made to the woman that I married. This ring is not my marriage. It's just a symbol of it. And, and, and wearing that ring doesn't make me married. Taking it off doesn't make me not married. Watch this. I just took my ring off. Uh-oh. I'm not married no more. I don't have a wife no more. I better get her back. Oh, okay, here we go. See, that's, that's silly. 
And you can see the silliness in that. The ring is just a symbol. Water baptism is a symbol of the true baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that's in our hearts. And uh, that's just, that's all I can say about that. <clears throat> one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. But, and I'll close with this verse, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So all these things are the same. They're all one. There's only one of them. But in us, every one of us, we're given grace according to the measure of the gift. I think that depending on how we choose to use the gifts God gives us, some of us have more grace in that regard than others. If you take the gifts God's given you and you, you, you expound upon them and you do all you can, in your service for Christ, then you're going to see a whole lot more of the benefits of these things. But it doesn't change the fact that there's only one. There's one God, there's one Holy Spirit, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one of all these things. But that one may be more evident um, and more manifest in one person than it is in another. It doesn't mean they have more of it. It just means they exhibit more of it. They show more of it. They've surrendered more of themselves. They've given more to the Lord they're doing more for the Lord uh, the only way I know to describe that is this there's, there's there's okay there's one spirit one faith one body and I'm not going to reread all this and that same one was in Billy Graham that's in me but you'll notice that Bo Billy Graham did a whole lot more with those same things that are offered to me too uh, it's not because Billy Graham's any better than I am or I'm any better than he is. It's because he's given more of himself and surrendered more and, and, and worked harder. Uh, that same potential is there for all of us. <coughs> so if you want to do something in the Lord, and we should, going back to that verse 1, he says, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation where with you are called. Billy Graham walked worthy of the vocation where with he was called. But using all of the same tools, we can do the exact same thing that Billy Graham did and that others did. And I'm trying. I'm not there, but I'm trying. The Lord can use each and every one of us in a way that honors Him and grows His, grow, it, it grows His, his, his gospel and, and spreads it. So I hope that uh, what you'll get out of this today and what I intended by it is for us to just work hard for the Lord, give what we have to honor and serve Him, to be unified in that endeavor, to love one another, and to, uh, again, to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we're called, and to understand that every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift. Uh, I think that the gifts are all... I, I can't tell you what yours are. I know that... Well, I'll say this as I close. I was told most of my life I talk too much, and it was always said to me in a negative way, Chad, you just talk too much. You got two ears, one mouth, you need to listen twice as much as you talk. And for a long time, it, it grieved me because I, I, I didn't like that about myself. I wanted to change it. But you know what? It's a gift, and it can be a gift, and it ought to be used to glorify God. So I'm trying to use it now. Instead of using it for all the wickedness I've used this mouth for over the years, now I'm trying to use it more for God. I could probably, I'm going to say this too, I could probably get away with preaching one, two messages a week. I probably could. A lot of churches do. It's what the world's used to. You know, and, and they pay the pastor the same, seemingly, whether he does three messages a week or one. Uh, and, and, and really, churches are to the point where they pay the guy, and, and whatever they pay him, they pay him, and, and he, he speaks however much, you know, maybe 20 minutes on Sunday, and and you do a whole lot of other things that, that don't have anything to do with, with preaching. But see, I can't do that. I'm not doing this for money anyway. Whether the church wants to pay me just for Sunday and Wednesday or, you know, if they whatever whatever they give me, I still have a gift that's given to me. This, this reference here in verse 7, and every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. The gift that Christ gave me was to use this mouth to honor and glorify Him. I can't just do that on Sunday and Wednesday. I do it every day. 
when I wasn't doing these devotionals. I'm telling somebody about Jesus every day. I'm using the mouth that God gave me, and I'm trying to expound upon the gift by sharing as much as I can, as often as I can, about the things that He's done for us, the things He continues to do for us. So what I would ask you to do is find what your gift is. Maybe you're not a talker. Maybe there's something else God's gifted you to do. But find a way to use it every day. Find a way to grow that gift and to glorify God continually and exponentially more than you ever have before. That's what I'm going to try to do. That's what I hope you'll try to do. And, and I hope, that, uh, hope that, that, well, I know God will bless you for it. But I hope that we can all figure out what it is He wants us to do with our gifts. And uh, we all have them. And I'm, I thank God for mine. I, I used to hate it, and now I've figured out that I, I love that I have that, and I'm, I'm thankful, and I just want to, I just want to find a way to use it more and more and more for His sake and for His honor. Well, I pray you have a wonderful day. I hope that uh, you'll, if you haven't already, that you, you'll pray for me and, and for each other, and uh, just just uh, well, just have a great day. We'll see you all tomorrow.